thank you guys and thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Thanks to the Alumni Society for having me. I am very excited to be here. So we are going to jump right into this now. So let's see if I can get this screen sharing going. Perfect. All right. So we are going to do this undress and the socio history of tattooing in the West. So this is a interesting topic for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is that it is a history that's not really discussed, but more importantly, it informs many, many conversations that are going on contemporarily and into the future. So it can seem strange to start with history, but I promise this all does connect to what's happening now. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the first real important point that I want to address here before we move on to our contemporary world is a really simple point. But it's the idea that tattoos are everywhere. And they are indeed everywhere, not just in the United States, not just in Europe or something along those lines. We're talking all over the world. And by being all over the world, we can know two things pretty easily since they are old. They are one, very, very old because they've had the time to spread all over the world. But also two, they're very important. Otherwise, they wouldn't have persisted. Over time, things fade all the time. So why wouldn't tattoos if they didn't have some importance? So on the left, for instance, you see a very contemporary tattoo done in a watercolor type of patterning, whereas on the right, we have a very traditional sakyan done in Thailand, done very, very differently from each other. <clears throat> and by that same vein, it's also worth taking a moment to talk about the fact that tattoos truly are not new. That there is a very, very common myth, especially in the United States contemporarily, that <clears throat> excuse me, tattooing began in Polynesia, specifically that it was discovered in the 1700s and then brought to Europe where it came and flourished like crazy. And frankly, that is very, very incorrect and has lots of issues with colonialistic histories, to be just honest. So when we talk about this, it's not necessarily a conversation about where they started because they don't really leave any material evidence. So that would be really a conversation for archaeology and hope that archaeologists get lucky to find the correct spot. So really the conversation becomes when we look at how old these are, how old are they to the Western world and Europe in particular? And we know that they didn't start in the 1700s with James Cook who went out and found everything and came back because we can look at the ancient Greeks. The ancient Greeks had tattoos, they had marks, they had words, and the word that they used for it was stigma. Stigma in this context is different than the social science idea of stigma. So I'm sorry if that's confusing at all, but it is the ancient Greek word. And it just means to cut or to mark or to burn. It is a hard one to translate and some things do get lost in translation for that reason, but they were doing this and they were marking their own individuals. They were talking about other groups that were marked within Europe. So there is a very well-established history of tattooing within Europe. That's the big idea that I want to illustrate to you guys before we continue any further down this conversation. And when I say that they have a very, very entrenched history, I'm saying they go back before a written record. So we can look at Utsi. Utsi is a really, really good example to have this conversation about how old some of these conversations can be. So Utsi is also known as the Iceman, and it is a mummified individual that was found in the Alps. And he is roughly about 9,000 years old. That is obviously significantly older than say the 1700s when we have this conversation of when it should have been invented. Now, admittedly his tattoos, they are definitely tattoos. You can see on the right-hand side that those are the markings that he has. They're spread all over his body. He has upwards of 30 some different markings across his body and these small little dots or lines, they aren't very large complex patterns. Something that is obviously distinctly different from our contemporary tattoos for the most part. And on the left, you can see the different areas where he had them. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the question becomes, why does he have these tattoos? And honestly, we don't really know. Again, this is a conversation about archaeology. And without having a written record, it makes it very difficult to analyze what's happening. Given the location of tattoos, there are hypotheses that it has to connect with either religion or it connects with medical ideas that these were supposed to be like fixing arthritis in your joints or something along those lines, or that they communicated status. But once again, the reason isn't necessarily important is the fact that he was having them and clearly he wouldn't be the only individual in the whole European continent that has tattoos that long ago. So there is this entrenched history well predating our common areas. So since tattoos are spread all over the world, it is worth taking a moment to at least just address how they're done. 
this is a very common misconception that people have, but as variant of tattoos as we can think of, just how widespread they are, how old they are, there's been a lot of different methods to actually tattoo the skin. Because in order to make a tattoo, all you have to do is get some type of pigment down to that dermis layer. That's it. That's what's going to make a tattoo. So that can be done in many, many different methods. So we can think, for instance, our contemporary world, yeah, we use tattoo machines and everything like that. But historically, there's tons of other avenues. There are, for instance, bamboo rods, or there's what we have here, which is a seal bone. It is a seal bone needle that was used among the Inuits. And they would take a piece of tendon that comes from seals and char it very quickly, and then tie it down to the end of the needle and scoop underneath its kind of skin. When you actually needle it through your skin, those ten or that charred tendon will then come through and leave a black line making a tattoo. So it doesn't necessarily seem like it's a traditional tattoo, but it is. It's pigment underneath the skin that is right by that dermis layer, and it's going to stay. But again, these are kind of the far flung, if we want to call it that, methods in which they're done. Contemporarily, we don't, at least in the Western world and in Europe in particular, and the United States, we don't really see this too often. Instead, what we do see is tattoo machines. That is really how most of the tattoos are done. And this is just an example of a tattoo machine. You can find many of them out there, but the tattoo machine for the most part is very simple in design. It's one or more needles that are going to rotate and quickly go into your skin far faster than a human hand could ever penetrate this. So the, <clears throat> excuse me, the tattoo machine was invented in 1901 by an individual named Samuel O'Reilly. That is an important point because we're going to see how impactful that is in just a second. So do bear that in mind. We're gonna put that on hold for a moment. But what is also important to understand is that since this tattoo machine was invented in 1901, it has been for the most part relatively unchanged. What we see is that generally speaking, you'll see different types of tattoo machines. They can be pneumatic, they can be electric or something along those lines, but they're all going to function in the exact same method. So we don't have to get too nitty gritty into this, but that's an important point to understand the technology has stayed very static in this conversation. So before we get into, again, our contemporary era, we can now look at tattoos in the West pre 19th century. And yes, so of course, we've already talked about Utsi, which is a great example of this. We alluded to the ancient Greeks about the different markings they had the stigma, but just to give a little more context and detail on that, because it does inform these conversations more fully, is that among the ancient Greeks, they would actually mark their slaves and criminals with the stigma. That's really how they utilized tattoos. It was not an aesthetic mark. It was nothing that people chose to get. It was a permanent mark to illustrate an individual's status or something that they had done. Hence, our notion of stigma now, a mark of something that's bad about someone, whether that is a true bad thing or a socially bad thing or a perceived bad thing, that's the same idea. Our idea of stigma comes from this notion of tattoo. So it really does connect in a lot of interesting ways right up front there. We also see tattooing, tattooing among this time period among early Christianity. This is also a conversation that gets obfuscated a lot in our contemporary world. But early Christianity, people would tattoo their faces and their arms very heavily, very heavily. And they would make these large trips to go out to Jerusalem to go get tattooed and then come back and show that they had been tattooed in the Holy Lands. So, <clears throat> excuse me, this image that's on your right is a good portrayal of what we start seeing here with early Christianity, because what we saw is that in, <clears throat> excuse me, King Harold II, who was arguably the last king of the Brits, but he died at the Battle of Hastings in 1066 CE. So we are talking a long time ago again, and he was beheaded in the battle, and the only way that they could actually identify him were through his tattoos that were on his body and on his arms. All of those tattoos were done in Jerusalem and they were these early ones that connected to Christianity. So again, we see these entrenched histories. The last big group that we see that also had tattoos very, very widely spread among their cultures are these barbarian groups. And I use the term barbarian incredibly loosely, incredibly loosely, because obviously it's an inflammatory term to say the very least. And again, it's very colonialistic, but what these barbarian groups are really referring to or anything that wasn't part of the, and again, I'm using this in quotations, but can't really see it, civilized world of the time. Any of the major civilizations, the winners of history, if you want to view it that way, anyone else was a barbarian. So we have the Scandinavian Rus, the Celts, many different Slavic groups, Germanic tribes, 
all of these groups were very well tattooed. And again, we have reports of that from ancient Greece writers, from Herodotus, from, Herodotus, from Julius Caesar himself talking about it. It's a very common area. However, when we now start talking about our contemporary world, or at least the more contemporary world, what we start talking about really is having a conversation about how they've changed since the 1850s. And the 1850s may seem like an arbitrary point to start at, but it is really a critical time, mostly because of the Industrial Revolution. <clears throat> the Industrial Revolution absolutely reshaped everything about our society that we could possibly conceive of. I mean, I'm talking everything from how baby food is produced to the amount of cheese that we consume to our overwhelming mycophobia to how our families are structured and everything else between that you could possibly imagine. Tattoos were there as well. So we talk about the modern history of fashion, we talk about modern history of tattoos, all of these kind of conversations started about the 1850s. So the late 1800 shift is again 1850s to about the 1900s. The next big era that we look at is the golden age of tattooing, which is going to be about from 1900s to just after the World War II. Then we have the rebel era, which lasts until roughly the early 70s, late 60s. Then we have the tattoo renaissance that will last up until about the year 2000. And now we are in the contemporary era. So we'll go through each one of these five points because this is truly how these conversations start building and actually informing each other. <clears throat> so we can start with the late 1800 shift and the late 1800 shift is a really, really fun point to begin this conversation because <clears throat> excuse me, the world is radically different now, as we are all aware, than it was in the late 1800s. But to the point where we are now seeing that our form of entertainment, our form of enjoyment would be going on the internet, turning on TV, listening to the radio, all these things that couldn't be done. So what was actually fun at the time were going to carnivals and freak shows. And again, freak show, again, I use very loosely because it is, once again, a very inflammatory term. However, freak show at its core is truly what we are talking about because a freak, historically speaking, was not some individual that was, <clears throat> excuse me, malformed in some way or did something beyond those kind of like corporeal levels. What we see is that a freak was truly someone that would bite off the head of a live chicken. That's it. That's what a freak was. So a freak show was you would pay to go into a tent to watch someone bite off the head of a live chicken. That eventually then transformed into other types of acts and other activities that people would do. And that turned into the sideshows that we, is the more common term to speak of. But freak show is an important point to talk about here because that was a way to talk about all of these different acts that were going on at the same time. One of those acts was the display of primitive people. And sometimes primitive, again, is a very inflammatory word to use, but we are talking history here. So Primitive in that sense, again, just means someone that wasn't part of the hegemonic power structure, someone that wasn't in that position of power, meaning our Western societies as we think about them. So many of the native groups. And what they would do is that they would take these native peoples, bring them into large fairs and show people how they lived very loosely in some fake way and show their tattoos. In addition to that, we also had carnival workers who realized the power that they could have by getting tattooed, how appealing it was to the American public so, excuse me, they would go out and get, get tattooed. On the left, you see that picture of a woman. She's known as the tattooed lady. She is heavily tattooed from this era and all of these tattoos were done just to make her an object to come and look at and gawk at. And because of that, the tattoos became so wildly popular and became deeply entrenched into working class life. Individuals would see this and it was a normalized process. That's the thing. While standard individuals wouldn't have them, still you would look at them and they were part of that every day. Another big group that was really important to this late 1800 shift as well were navies. And when I'm talking about navies, I'm very specifically talking about the American and the English navies. And what we saw here does align with this kind of fake history that we have in the United States about how, his, or about how tattoos were, <clears throat> excuse me, discovered, excuse me, if that's the word that we want to use. But these sailors would go out on to different assignments and so on and so forth. And as they are going out, they go to these far flung places, the world at the time, because travel was not easy. They see these native groups, they get tattoos, they come back, and then your standard person sees them tattooed. That tattoo immediately becomes highly symbolic of this travel, of this freedom, of this romanticized life of a sailor. 
You are free from the fetters of what binds you to this world of your humdrum life that you can go off and go explore. And that's the same logic that underpinned these carnivals and freak shows as well. This freedom, this, this desire to go out and to be able to be different, to go and not be just the standard person in everyday life. And as we continue within this late 1800 shift, there's also another really important group, something that is very, very different than the previous ones we've discussed. And that's society men and women, both again, American and English. These were the very, very wealthy top, if we wanna call it contemporarily, it'd be like the top 1%, but the very, very wealthy individuals. And they were again, getting tattooed at a very, very large rate. But once again, this makes sense because Tattooing was very, very hard to come by at the time. It was not something that you could just go to your local corner shop and get something off the wall. This was a much more complex process. So to get these tattoos, individuals had to go travel, which took time, which then was a type of wealth that they had to go through, take this time off to go and became a very exclusive item, something that was very, very powerful to show off and had a lot of prestige. But, <clears throat> excuse me, these society men and women were not the first ones to do this. In fact, they were influenced by European royalty. And European royalty were truly the ones that kickstarted tattooing among the society individuals and really gave it a huge amount of prestige during this time period. And there are many different royals that we could point to for this, many, many, many different ones. But we can start that conversation pretty easily with King Edward VII. His tale is a bit lengthy, so I will summarize it very briefly, but Long story short, he was either kicked out or decided to travel, depending on the account that you listen to. But he was kicked out by Queen Victoria and told that he had to just leave for three years and travel the Middle East. While he was over there, he spent time in Jerusalem, got tattoos, specifically a Jerusalem cross, came back after three years, showed it off to everyone, and it became wildly popular in court. His son, George V, went off to, <clears throat> excuse me, went off to Japan to meet with Emperor Meiji at the time and came back with a dragon tattoo on his forearm with his brother. All of a sudden, we see these royals that are getting heavily tattooed, more than just one or two, they start spreading like crazy. And again, it's not just the English royal family. We can look at, again, like Denmark, we can look at know, Queen Olga II of Greece, we can look at tons of different cultures that are at the time there, lots of different royals. But here, what we see, <clears throat> excuse me, is that the Russian elites were also very much into this as well. So we see Peter the Great, we see Catherine the Great. On the left, we see Tsar Nicholas II with his dragon tattoo on his forearm. And that's an incredible picture. If truly we think about this, it's been a colorized negative for the most part. But from the 1800s, we had the last Tsar of Russia being tattooed, which is very fascinating. However, Again, that was the late 1800 shift. Something did cause an end to this. And logically, it should make sense. It's that invention of the tattoo gun. 1901, everything changed simply because of that tattoo machine. As it was actually created, it changed all the perceptions because now it's easy to get it done. You don't have to be some wealthy individual or in the navies to go out and have the time to travel to go get these done. Instead, anyone can just get a tattoo machine. You could order them in the back of magazines. They were advertised as so easy a child can do it. And they truly did advertise to children to be tattooists. That is the absolute insanity that we were talking about at this point. So truly when I'm saying that this is a radical shift, this is a radical shift. And what we started seeing was that all of a sudden tattoos were no longer this exclusive prestige item or this romanticized idea of travel or fun or freedom in that sense. Now they became something that was entrenched to the working class. The working class was so used to seeing that the freak shows, the carnivals, <clears throat> excuse me, being in the military, that all of a sudden they were very, very well understood to be the tattooed population. So tattoos received this very masculine, tough guy image. And the people that were really getting it were, yes, the working class, but also social outcasts or social fringe members, people that were just kind of on the outskirts of society lumberjacks or whatever we want to say, these heavily, or heavily masculine, if we call it that, individuals become very tattooed. In that same time period as well, we also have the military being deeply involved. Now it's not just the Navy. It truly is the military as a whole. And as we start looking at what these conversations mean, this is where we get the rise of the Americana style of tattooing. 
And Americana is still done now. You can go to lots of places The people that specialize in it. The person who did the tattoo on the right here, Mike Wilson, he's known as one of the best Americana tattooists in the world. It's very defined by these bold lines, limited color palettes, and very, very patriotic designs. I mean, truly tattooing during the golden age or golden age tattooing was very, very patriotic and very important to that. But the other big social factor here that is critical to understanding this era is the tattoo shops. The tattoo shops became this hub. They became the social nexus where everyone would go to hang out. You weren't going to the diner. You weren't going to this. If you were in the working class and you were a male, then you were going to go hang out at a tattoo shop. And these tattoo shops weren't necessarily always located in the best areas, but this is where you went. And you would exchange these stories of war or of work or <clears throat> excuse me, of sexual conquest. And that's what really entrenched these masculine tough guy ideas with tattoos. And that's what really set it. Now, the reason this is called the golden age of tattooing, because I know it's not very clear in that idea, but really it's called the golden age of tattooing simply because this is the time when tattoos were most widely accepted. Socially, they were very, very common in the United States and they weren't seen as something bad or problematic in any way. Unfortunately, that does obviously change. And that's when we can jump into this next one called the rebel era. The rebel era is really the start, if we wanna say that, of a lot of the perceptions that some people have now in our world. Mostly older individuals in the United States, their perception of tattoos and tattooed individuals does stem from the rebel era. And this started after World War II, a few years after it. Mostly once we start seeing that there's a spike in the, <clears throat> excuse me, a spike in the middle class that comes from World War II and by result, a decreased patriotism and decreased working class. So what that would mean is that all these previous ideas of tattooing that we saw during the golden era, these hyper patriotic ones and so on and so forth, they just don't work anymore. They're going to collapse. And that's exactly what happened during the rebel era. Instead of these working class members being the center of the tattoo figuration is the word that we use. Instead, what we see is that the people that become the true center of this tattoo world are the fringe members of society. And these fringe members of society, they are really fringe members. We are not talking about say lumberjacks anymore, right? Now we're talking about like hippies and rockabillies and outlaw motorcycle clubs and gang members and prisoners. These are truly the populations that we we're discussing here. And these were the ones that did have tattoos during the time and were very, very common with it. On the right, you see someone, well, she's a woman that's very involved with in the history of outlaw motorcycle world, but she's getting tattooed by a motorcycle, uh, outlaw motorcyclist tattooist. I mean, it's a very, very interesting snapshot and picture. And you can see the tattoo style that's going on with all of their work. It's very, very iconic in that sense. But these fringe members of, of society that become central to tattoo figuration, they are important because what they are doing is they're reshaping the image of tattoos in a very dramatic fashion. That tattoos all of a sudden are not something that are artistic. They're not something that is a prestige item like we saw in the late 1800s. They're not socially acceptable because why would you have something that criminals have? Why would you have something that prisoners have? So on and so forth or dropouts or druggies or any of the other type of derogatory notions that you could say towards any people in these groups. And that's really what the media clicked onto at the time. That was really the image that we start hearing. <clears throat> Excuse me. But those people that were involved in these groups were, that were these fringe members, they deeply, deeply embraced tattoos to the point where, and I apologize ahead of time, you guys can ear muff if it's a problem, I'm going to say an F word real quick, so I'm sorry. but. What we do see is that Janis Joplin got up on stage holding her chihuahua, very, very drunk, and just pulled out one of her breasts to a whole audience and said to them, do you guys see this? Everyone, of course, looking at her, not really sure what she's doing. She's pointing at a tattoo that's on her breast. And she's like, do you see this? If you see a tattoo, do you know what that means? Anyone with a tattoo likes to fuck. That, those were her exact words that she used. And that is a mind-boggling statement to make a, a whole sweeping notion about anyone with some type of body art is a certain way, but more importantly, that this is what was socially accepted and understood at the time. Tattoos were a sign of defiance. They were a part of the counterculture, and that is the core of how they ended up being seen that way during that rebel era. Then, as we continue through time here, we get into the tattoo renaissance. 
And the tattoo renaissance is a really fun time because it helped reshape a lot of what we know of the tattoo world. And <clears throat> where we had the golden era where they were, tattoos were most accepted during that rebel era, other individuals have also called it the dark ages of tattooing because it set it back so far socially and made it seem so problematic. The tattoo renaissance is kind of like the renaissance, right? It completely revamps this in every way. And the big impetus that happened during the tattoo renaissance was a change of the tattooists, but also the change in the clientele themselves. So previously, we've only discussed change in the clientele, but this as a change in the actual tattooist is very important because we have the introduction of classically trained avant-garde artists that come into this conversation now. And these classically trained, <clears throat> excuse me, classically trained avant-garde artists, they're using skin and tattooing as their medium. And now they're applying original works. It's no longer flash designs that were transferred around from person to person or from tattooist to tattooist. What we are seeing is these very unique pieces like onto our right. This is a tattoo artist named Jan Black. He's very, very avant-garde with his contemporary tattooing, but this is the point. He is a classically trained Incist and then came into tattooing and then applied all of his thoughts into there. It's just a very, very different style that allowed for some differences to really occur, namely, that we can now call some tattoos art. Because historically, I would argue very strongly that they weren't really art, they were craft. Maybe the people creating the original flashes, I could say that would be art, but historically it was craft. You were not trained to be an artist, you were coming in to learn how to make a tattoo that looks the way as it does on the wall. That's the big difference. And with that big change of these avant-garde artists, we are now getting a huge change in the population that's involved. Namely, we are now having the middle class that gets involved into this conversation, as well as women, both of which are underrepresented populations in history of tattooing. I mean, they are ones that were never present. So with the middle class, what really impact that has is that we have a younger, more mainstream audience that are becoming tattooed. And when we have a general populace that's more mainstream and younger, that means that there's going to be this force that happens in the future that they are going to cause some type of change with a permanent work like this. And so what we started seeing is that this introduction of the avant-garde artists coupled with the middle-class individuals who could pay for true artists and not just tattooists, we now see this weird dualism. We see a divide between art and craft of high status and low status. Some tattooists, for instance, they are gonna be seen as a high status. It's a good thing to get it from them. Whereas other ones, <clears throat> they aren't really artists, they're craftsmen, and those are low status items. It's our ideas behind a good tattoo and a bad tattoo contemporarily. They stem from a lot of these ideas that we see here. That introduction of women into the tattoo, excuse me, into the tattoo figuration during this time period is also super critical to everything moving forward, not the least of which is second wave feminism happening right around the same time period. But more importantly, what we see is that it helped challenge a lot of these classical notions, like nice girls don't get tattoos. That is an infuriating concept to hear, or for instance, something I heard from a bunch of my participants, wow, you used to be so pretty. Why would you go and get a tattoo? It's a very, very problematic notion. And this introduction of women is challenging that notion during that tattoo renaissance. Clearly it's not over, otherwise I wouldn't be saying I had your participants telling me this or anything like that, but it does help challenge these ideas. It gains women more acceptance, more equality, Really, we are talking about equal rights, socially speaking, in a very weird avenue. We're using tattoos to talk about how people are gaining their rights and maintaining power and becoming more central to society. That's what this is. It is having all these other conversations that go along with it. Then finally, if we move past that, we are now into the contemporary era. And the contemporary era, again, is about the year 2000 forward. And <clears throat> excuse me, the contemporary era is also known, I should say, as the supermarket era or the second tattoo renaissance. I personally dislike both of those names for a lot of reasons, most of which is how they skew the information that we're reading about now. So contemporary era is where I go with. But when we talk about the contemporary era, we are talking about our current world. And right now, I mean, as of two years ago, about 30% of Americans have a tattoo. Of those individuals that have a tattoo, about 79% of them have more than one. So tattoos are very common because when we talk about 30% of Americans with tattoos, what we are talking about are people that are in the extreme ranges of both of these age brackets, people that are extremely old and we're talking people that are 18 and under. 
So these 18 and under are obviously going to be skewing our results because most 18 and unders don't have tattoos. That said, what we do know is that most of this 30% of tattooing that we see on Americans is on younger bodies and that that number is rapidly growing. So there is a lot of importance that that holds when we talk about what this can mean for us in our day-to-day -day lives as society or any of these other concepts that we wanna look at. But the contemporary era as a large construct, <clears throat> excuse me, or rather as a general notion can be well summarized with one word and that's choice. This whole era is about choice on the part of the tattooist as well as the part of the tattooee. We have the idea that tattooists can now, well, yes, tattoo whatever they want, they are artists, but they can do it in whatever styles they please. They have the rights to say no to certain clientele. They can choose to only tattoo in certain parts. For instance, I know of one tattoo artist that only tattoos palms, turns down any other jobs other than palms. That is just one way that we can look at this notion of choice that comes into play. But from the tattooee side of it, the people receiving the tattoos, well, they get the choice of what artists they want, what price bracket they want, where geographically they want this, where corporeally they want these. I mean, there's so much choice that you have. And by having all of this choice, what we start seeing is that there's way more custom work that's popping up now, way more than ever before, and much less flash. That, again, does not mean that flash is going away. What we see is that artists are creating their own flash and keeping it to their own work. That's different than the historical notions of flash that were traded around. That does allow for these ideas to be very unique to the artists themselves. And with that greater customability that both customers and artists have, we see an increase in individuality. So, <clears throat> excuse me, when we start talking about this, tattoos are deeply, deeply connected to individuality, to identity, to all these concepts that are integral to us, our sense of self, how we formulate this, our bodies. And as we can go through this, it becomes quite evident that these conversations are very, very important to have. Another big, big change that happened during this era as well to the tattoo figuration is that the tattoo population changed that now we don't just have, say, the middle class getting tattooed or just the working class or the royals. Now we have people from all walks of life. We're talking all socioeconomic statuses, race, ethnicity, religion, so on and so forth. All of these different groups are getting tattooed and they have the capability, they have the choice to do so. So once again, there's a huge amount of freedom as the idea of works to underpin a lot of these conversations. The tattoo on our right, just because I've been mentioning the others, is a local tattoo artist. She, it, well, relatively local, but her name's Lauren Vandeveer and she tattoos pretty close out of Lakewood. And it's very interesting. She does these great bold black works like this that are well detailed as well as doing awesome shading with some color and some very, very fun stylistic works. But that's this contemporary era. Like we have the choice to do whatever we want. And in that same vein, as we keep talking about these contemporary, this contemporary era, what we see is that technology is now coming to the forefront of our conversation here. That yes, since 1901, technology has been relatively unchanged for tattooing machines and how tattooing is actually done, but that's not necessarily what we're talking about here. The technology we're referring to now is this idea, <clears throat> excuse me, of using our phones and going on the internet. Namely, that the huge amount of social networks that are currently available to all of us all the time, Instagram or whatever, Facebook, so on and so forth, we are just being bombarded with images of tattoos if that's what we want, even if that's what we don't want. We look at some of these massive Instagram accounts, the most followed ones in the world, especially in the United States, we can really narrow that down. Of the 10 most followed ones, seven of the people have tattoos very heavily. Two of them pretend to have tattoos and one is the... Kim Kardashian is the only one that says that she really dislikes tattoos. All of the others are very much in favor of them. And we see this all the time. If that doesn't say how well that we're discussing and showing some of these areas, I don't really know how else to express that other than that they have well over a billion followers combined. And that is a staggering number. But on top of that, we also have foreign based websites like Reddit, for instance that didn't exist before. And now if you have a question, it's easy to find a subgroup of interest that's, that can answer that. Do you want a specific style? Do you want a spe excuse me, specific price point or a specific region? You can find that very easily through these different social networks or <clears throat> excuse me, forum based areas. But that does lead to a very important point here. And that's this idea of stigma. 
So I hear this question a lot. Does stigma around tattooing still exist? And I have to be honest. Yeah, it does. It really still exists. There is still absolutely stigma around tattoos in our society, but it is changing. And that doesn't mean it's going away. It means that it's changing as all of these things have changed in the past. And we can look at white collar jobs as a great example of this, that historically speaking, no, tattoos were not acceptable within that, within that realm because obviously that was not going to be seen as professional. But within our contemporary world here, that has to change. Because if we have 30% of tattoo or 30% of our population is tattooed and much of that is on a younger population, who's entering the workforce? That younger population, who's going to join these positions of power? That younger population eventually. If a company or an organization chooses to discard someone simply because they're tattooed, that is a very, very foolish choice without understanding the context simply because you are eliminating potential individuals to drive benefit at almost zero cost. It's a very strange way. And the types of change that we are seeing are impactful. That yes, the stigma is going to be around, but there's greater levels of acceptance and that's slow. It's happening right now, but we can absolutely attribute this to even like law firms where it's becoming more, excuse me, more appropriate to show a tattoo in the office, maybe not in court, but in the offices and things of the such. But the big reason that it's hard to talk about tattoos right now in the contemporary era, or rather the reason it's so fascinating to talk about tattoos right now in the contemporary era is because we are living in a liminal state, not just us as individuals. I mean, us as a whole world, as a whole country, as a community, you pick your us that you want for this because it's true. We are living in this liminal state. Things are changing. And much of this, <clears throat> excuse me, is not going to be attributed to things say like 2020 or something like this as a very large construct, what we are talking about is the fact that the same way that the industrial revolution radically reshaped everything in our lives, the information revolution is doing the exact same thing. And we are living through it right now. The information revolution only began with the invention of the microchip in the late 60s, and it's still developing. We are still seeing the implications that this is having, and it's impacting tattoos as well, because it's not just tattoos its power, its stigma, its individuality, and all these other areas. So we are at a point when things are changing and tattoos are a medium by which we can talk about all the other avenues of society and our social changes, our cultural changes through something. It's a very tangible, symbolic area that we can then build out. So the last real area that I wanna talk about briefly before I sum this up is tattoos in the social sciences. And I alluded to this just now, but Tattoos are more than just ink or a curiosity because that is how they are framed in the social sciences a lot. That's just something kind of like, ha, huh, cool. That's what you do, fun. What's your real work on? And that's a problem, not just for people like me that do this stuff, obviously. Yeah, I'm not happy about that. But more importantly, it's truly an issue because these tattoos are highly, highly symbolic. You can see through this whole conversation we've been having here that, <clears throat> excuse me, the history of tattooing is not new, it's not straight or honestly very well understood by a majority of people. Yes, this is very surface level information in one way and, and another, a very interesting and complex one as well. Because anything that was said, any one of these topics that we talked about or any offhand mark, remark I made, each one truly should be raising questions or interest or something. Even if you, you truly don't care about tattoos, I would be interested why you're here, but even if you truly don't care about tattoos, still, you probably have an, a question or an idea or something that peaked, like, why didn't he talk about X during this? That's exactly the point. We are talking about something that is a form of cultural production and performance. It means something a lot more than just having a mark on you. There's a reason why, and people understand it for a much different reason. And for that reason, tattooing and the studying of it, it has to be highly, highly interdisciplinary. I mean, it is an intersectional topic at its core. Yes, I can approach all this from a sociological perspective. Yes, I can approach it all from an anthropological perspective, but my research is not one or the other. My research is both. I argue for a cooperation, theoretically, between anthropology and sociology so that a better understanding of tattoos can be had and that we can then share this and look at it. And by that, excuse me, by that same logic, other groups should be doing the same thing. Other types of social sciences, other researchers, other sciences, other humanities, 
so on and so forth. Tattoos are deeply, deeply important to these conversations as indicators, as predictors, as marks of the past, of so on and so forth. And again, this is a short list that I threw together quickly of some of these intersectional topics. I mean, truly anything that we talk about, I could quite argue has a much deeper level to these areas. But we're talking stigma, identity, performance, sex, gender, race, ethnicity, religion, socioeconomic status, sport, deviance, economics, popular culture, technology. You get the point. I mean, these are very, very depth or deep conversations that require a lot of inter interdisciplinary work. And while I love what I study, trust me, I do way too much, but well, that is the case. One, two, a handful of people can't make a whole understanding of all of this kind of stuff. It requires this cooperation and really that these tattoos are super interesting and omnipresent in our lives just begs to be looked at and begs to be understood in some capacity. So with that, I want to say thank you guys. I really appreciate it. I believe we have some time for some questions, but just to show you just a couple more here, just because some of the styles are interesting before we dig into it. We have some more slightly photorealistic on the right, a great artist. I'll show you guys a list of artists in just a second. And on the left, we have patch tattooing, a legitimate style where it looks like a patch that's on you. It's not, it's a tattoo, it's your skin. You could touch it like any other but it's done to look like a patch and it will heal looking like a patch. That is some of the kind of differences that we're getting with this contemporary era as a result of where we've been. So here are the artists. I'll leave that up here for half a second. And then Emily, did you want to take over to do this? Yes, thank you, Sam, for that in-depth look at the history of tattoos. I know my parents grew up in probably the rebel era of tattoos. So I had no idea about royal families getting tattoos. I was just always grew up thinking it was like a rebel thing to do, you know, when you're a teenager and your parents, when you turn 18, you get a tattoo. Um, so we do have a question uh, from, um, let's see, is it, is it Tiara? Uh, let me look. Uh, yeah, Tiara Thomas, okay. Uh, do you think that some stigma regarding tattoos are related to tattoo quality, poorly done, or um, the location? So being on your face, hands, neck, um, non-traditional versus uh, coverable areas, things like that? That's a very good question. Well, set of questions, but yes, those are two very good questions. And yes, first off, let's start with the stigma regarding the quality of tattoos. Absolutely, yes. I cannot stress that enough, that if we want to look in the white collar environment in particular, <clears throat> excuse me, what we start seeing is that when we talk about which tattoos are going to be acceptable versus not in workplaces, they are going to be higher quality tattoos. The ones that are done very poorly or ones that are seemingly done poorly, because that's a very subjective notion, those are ones that are going to be seen as less acceptable and problematic and much larger stigmatization that results from that. However, that said, there are some that are intentionally made to look kind of poor, but they are done by great artists. So there is kind of the same conversation that you'd see in the art world that there are certain artists that are very, very good and there's prestige associated with them. And as such, their product is significantly better and has way more, <clears throat> excuse me, cultural importance or cultural power than some of these other areas. As far as the locations go, there are issues when it comes to talking about the acceptability of certain locations, but the coverable kind of locations of our body, again, talk about a lot of these Victorian eras of modesty that we have to, talk, that we understand in our current society. For instance, why do we wear the shirts that we wear? Why is this considered formal simply because it has a little collar or something like that? I mean, these kind of ideas are the same idea when we talk about the location, which ones are acceptable versus not. So hands, face, we do have these that are acceptable in our society. There are women that get, and men for that matter too, I shouldn't be, do that, sorry, but there are individuals that get eyeliner tattooed onto their faces or that get blush or that get lipstick. I mean, those are tattoos, those are facial tattoos, but those are also totally not stigmatized in our society. So there really is this kind of interplay that's going on with that. But yes, they are definitely going to be impacting the stigma as well. And that is a great segue into our next question, I believe from Margie. How do you see medical or cosmetic tattoos fitting into the discussion? Those are two different conversations that do connect, but very good questions as well. Medical tattoos or paramedical tattoos, depending on the term that we want to use to discuss this, but they are mostly tattoos to either do one of two things. One, 
<clears throat> excuse me, to cover up some type of issue that is going on with the body, something that they are uncomfortable with, like say discoloration of skin or burn marks or scars or something along those lines, or they're going to be one of these ones that make do, or I'm sorry, <clears throat> excuse me, um, lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. They are either these ones that are going to be the paramedical that do that, or they're going to be the ones that are meant to communicate some type of medical message to, to others. So for instance, we've seen a University of Miami, for instance, dealt with this not too long ago, which is why it's an easy point. A man came into the emergency room. He was a John Doe, didn't know anything. All he had was do not resuscitate tattooed onto his chest. That is a medical tattoo in that sense. You also see individuals that have like, for instance, their diabetes is tattooed onto them and so on and so forth. So from those perspectives, super important, right? But yeah, those are going to fit into a conversation in the same way they would everything else. Are they going to be stigmatized? Is it one of these things? Because it's not a conversation about art per se. Art is only one facet of this conversation. The medical side of it is deeply important because ethically, as like a biomedical ethicist here, how do you deal with that when they're in an emergency room and you see someone that tattooed? Is that considered a standing order or is it an artistic piece? And that now we're getting into some of these minutia that actually do truly matter with that conversation. Again, with that paramedical tattooing, as we were discussing a second ago, great, great uses of that. But the whole point of paramedical tattooing, for the most part, <clears throat> excuse me, is to blend in to not be shown as a tattoo. So it's a little different when we start talking about stigma related to medical tattooing. That doesn't, I personally, I should say, haven't come across that in any of my research or anything that I've read, but I could definitely see a huge part of that. Now, cosmetic tattooing is again, a huge part of this as well, but there are limits. So you see people that have really, really, really nicely done cosmetic tattoos. And on the flip side, you see ones that make you pretty sad. But I mean, the point is, we are, again, talking about the quality at which they're done. And that quality is subjective. It's something that's going to be some, something that's decided on by these large social factors. It's not individual. As much as all of us like to think that we are special and we have our own tastes, we don't. Our tastes come from large social patterning. And that's something that's very well understood and discussed within sociology, for sure. But very good one. And I believe this might be our final question. Um, from Ari, can you speak on many Jewish cemeteries still banning the burial of individuals who have tattoos? Absolutely. So there is a thought within Judaism, I should say, because belief is a hard word to say here, but uh, definitely a thought within Judaism that tattooing is not acceptable on the skin, that it's something that's problematic. And as such, many Jewish cemeteries either ban the burial of individuals who have tattoos or they require that the skin get flayed off before their burial. And both of those from a social aspect versus a ethical, excuse me, from an ethical perspective, truly don't matter and at the same time are highly important. And I know that that's the most frustrating juxtaposition I could possibly say, but give me one second to explain that. It doesn't matter because at its core, what we're talking about is a religious belief and that if these individuals that are part of the community want to engage in that religious belief and in this practice and they understand that and they get these tattoos in life and know what the repercussions are or the practice of doing so that's very much a personal choice that has to do with the community that's fine and in judaism there are multiple layers of belief or multiple levels whether we talk the chassidim or we talk about the reforms i mean there's a huge difference in the level of belief that we're discussing so there is definitely an aspect that comes into that conversation as well. From this other side though, where we're saying ethically, is it okay? Again, we have a really big kind of concern to look at here. Like, should we be doing this to bodies? Can we be doing this? And at the same time, are we reinforcing a stigma that shouldn't exist or something along those lines? And so it's not about being right or wrong, right? It's not about being good or bad. It's about these ideas of what are the social impacts of having this, of these practices, because that's really the core of this. If we look at these cemeteries and, that are doing this, well, what does that mean to the Jewish community that's involving with it? Is it one synagogue? Is it multiple synagogues? Is it multiple cities and communities? What is that whole conversation going to mean to these people that are living in it and then to those that know them and so on and so forth? So. I think that addresses the question. I hope that answered it enough. 
Yes, I think so. And I'm gonna squeeze in one more question before we wrap up. Um, and this is a personal question that I had, but I'm just curious as to between the, the golden age and the contemporary age, if there has been a shift between, um, you know, in the golden age, someone just going to pick out a, a tattoo because a group of friends were going to do that and you're just going to get tattoos. And if you've seen a shift to the contemporary age of to ta tattoos having more meaning um, and personal, um, that represent personal things in someone's life, if you've seen a shift in that. Mm, that's definitely a good question. Uh, this contemporary, I'll speak to that part first about meaning, that this contemporary, yes, you do see that meaning becomes a very important part to people's stories about tattoos. And very commonly when I'm studying this, people are like, oh, so let me tell you about my tattoo. And they tell me the meaning behind their tattoo. And that's great and wonderful. And it's always fascinating to hear. But from an academic standpoint, part of me wants to say, I don't care next because you have personal meaning that you've ascribed to it. Great. That's fantastic. And that means a whole lot. What that personal meaning is because my father gave me a globe on this day. So I got it tattooed on me or something. Who cares? That truly doesn't matter. What does matter is that you've connected it to family, but you've also connected it to these large social realms of individuality of self and all these things. Now that, is definitely something that we're seeing an increase of with this contemporary era, mostly from that uh, the tattoo renaissance that then led to the contemporary era because of that individuality and more personal choice in the artists. So historically speaking, no, there wasn't as much of that. I am not comfortable to make the Blinken statement of saying like the majority or all of them weren't that way, but mm -hmm. I can say that for sure it was not a big part of the process in which they considered this that they would go because it was a social nexus, it was a place to hang out, it was something to communicate to others that they were part of a group and so on and so forth. The same way that tattooing is now. We are part of a group or we aren't part of a group and that means X, Y, and Z to those that interpret it. Awesome, well, this has been a fascinating conversation and on behalf of the Alumni Association and Case Western Reserve University, we would like to thank you, Sam, and uh, as well as the rest of you for attending the event today. And we hope you enjoy the rest of homecoming weekend. Have a great day.